Good morning. Hello, everybody. I'm Jill Moran, Executive Director from the Special Events Institute, and I'm happy to bring you our Wednesday webinar on Apples Aren't Always Apples, Why No Two Academic Event Planners Are Alike. And I'm really pleased to have three top-notch planners with us today. We have Amy Stevens. Amy is from um, Eastern State um, listen, Eastern Virginia Medical School and um, we also have Brady Miller CSEP from Indiana University and Richard Williams from Loyola University Chicago. So I'm going to start with Amy and let her tell you a little bit about her background, her position um, and how she got started in the business. Good morning. Um I'm A. Stevens from Eastern Virginia Medical School. We're located in Norfolk, Virginia. We're a pretty small school, uh, independent medical graduate school. I'm not affiliated with a undergraduate program or a hospital, so pretty pretty small institution. We recently celebrated our 40th anniversary, and we have about uh, 1,600 students. So. Big difference between, say, us and Loyola and Indiana, much, much smaller institution. So, Brady, why don't you tell us a little bit about your position? Uh, I'm Brady Miller. I work at Indiana University. We have um, eight campuses in our system. Um, among those, we serve about 115,000 students. Uh, here at the flagship campus in Bloomington, we have, probably have between 40 and 45,000 students. Um, our university was founded in 1820, so we're coming up on our bicentennial year in 2020, which means we're um, already having rumblings as to the types of events we'll be um, uh, producing for that celebration. Um, and then you, you want to hear about you want to hear about my background now, Jill? Or um, let's <laughs> let's go over to Richard, and then um, then I'll go back to Amy and say how we all got started in the business. Okay. So Richard, share a little bit about your position and um, your university. Hi everybody, um, I'm Richard Williams from Loyola University of Chicago. We are a uh, private Catholic Jesuit university in the heart of Chicago. We have about 16,000 students on four campuses, um, three of which um, are here in Chicago. Our, our professional campus is downtown in the heart of the Gold Coast area. Our um, main undergraduate campus is up north in a neighborhood called Rogers Park. Our medical school is in a western suburb called Maywood. And then we have a campus in Rome where our students can study abroad for a semester or for a year or other students from other universities as well. Um, we are coming up on our 150th anniversary, which is, I think, a sequicentennial or something like that. I can't say it. But we've already started talking, like Brady, about what that's going to look like. Um, 150 is not a pivotal year, but it's, it's an important year uh, nonetheless. I've been here 12 years, and six years have been as director. Cool. I'm going to um, just direct everybody. There's a function called a poll. And we're going to start a poll to ask you if you are currently working in academic event planning. So you can just um, check off yay or nay, and we'll show the results of that. And while everyone's doing their poll, let's have Amy tell us a little bit about how she got started in academic event planning. Um, I kind of fell into it like a lot of other planners. Um, I actually have a degree in elementary education. Uh, and was kind of planning and producing nonprofit events for causes near and dear to my heart just independently. Um, I moved back into the Hampton Roads area and taught for several years, and a position opened at Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters, which is Virginia's only freestanding pediatric hospital, and they needed an event planner. And, at the time, I was young and single, no responsibilities, and they needed somebody that could do a lot of the um, less glamorous work, setting up golf tournaments and, and um, really a lot of off-site events. And so that's how I just kind of fell into it. I got really lucky. My skill set was transferable, and um, I've kind of just been lucky and, and keep finding positions. Um, to hone my skill set and grow as a planner, and just really fortunate. 
and the opportunity opened up at um, EVMS, and then you you joined joined the school. Yes, I've been here for four years now. Um, work with a great team. We have five folks on our team, including the director Sharon Gabriel, and um, we continue to work fantastically as a team and elevate each other and learn new things from each other. And we all bring something really great to the team. And um, while the dynamics are really different from the hospital um, where I used to work, it's, it's been a neat change for me in learning more about ceremonies um, and protocol, which we really didn't have before in my previous position. That's fun. Now, Brady, tell us how you got into the biz. Uh, my uh, entire life, I'd, I'd always been involved in music and theater, and so... Um, but when I got to undergrad, I actually got my bachelor's degree in uh, journalism. Um, so um, my, my first job out of college, I actually became the program and marketing director for a nonprofit um, arts center in Manhattan, Kansas. And as, as part of that job, I was not only doing the marketing for the facility, but I was also producing special events like gallery openings or fundraisers, um, receptions, um, uh, things like that. Um, and I was also in charge of renting the facility to outside groups. So um, and with only three people working there, that also meant I was, um, you know, climbing up 20-foot ladders and um, putting uh, Legos into the grid in the ceiling and things like that too, because there was nobody else to do that. So <laughs> um, after a few years there, a job opened up at the foundation for Kansas State University to do events full time, and so I was able to move over there and ultimately um, become the assistant director of events. Um, eventually, I moved here to Indiana, where I moved. Um, I worked for one of our um, other campuses for several years, where I managed um, special projects and um, events for the campus's chancellor before moving up here to Bloomington about a year and a half ago um, to produce events for the president and provost of the Bloomington campus. Um, and then, um, as part of the benefit for working for a university, of course, getting to take classes for free. So. I was able to pick up my master's degree earlier this year, and I did my thesis on commencement uh, ceremonies. So um, that's my that's that's my background and how I ended up where I am and what I'm doing. In your title at Indiana, uh, it is um, director of special and academic events, which um, I joke is the most catch-all title um, possible. <laughs> it all you have to do it all. Right. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to see where people come from because you know lots of folks that want to get into academic planning wonder what what's the best background. So it's really interesting to see where everyone's path has taken them and how they've landed where they are. Richard, uh, tell us a little bit about your career path. Um, I too fell into this. Um, I went to um, college to be a high school music teacher. Um, I tell everyone if they watch Glee, I was supposed to be Mr. Shu. And um, life took a different path. I decided to um, pursue acting for a while, realized I didn't have the drive to do that. And the first job I got was with a PR firm here in the city of Chicago um, that handled um, most of the major events in the city. My first event was the opening of Oprah Winfrey's restaurant, believe it or not, that doesn't exist anymore. And um, from there, I went into catering. From there, I went into corporate events. Then I went into not-for-profit, worked for the Joffrey Ballet for five years, and then I came here. <clears throat> and so it's I, it's it been interesting that each one of my jobs actually has lended itself perfectly to what I do. Um, and you combine that with my degrees in musical music and theater, and it's sort of the perfect combination now. Um, and it's it's interesting that I now teach the teach a class on events management. Um, so you know, as you as we all know, you can go to school for this now. Um, but back when we were young, you couldn't. And um, I was saying earlier to Jill that this business were a little bit of the land of misfit toys. Um, that we all bring something to the table that I think benefits us in what we do. Um, I came to Loyola in 2002, um, a year after our president, a new president who has turned the university around. And I became director six years ago, I think. Let's um let's spring into the next group of questions. Um, what office do do you report to? You know, we'll start with Richard. We'll go backwards here. Um, you know, what offices do you report to? Who really drives the events that you have to produce for the campus? 
Yeah, we officially sit in the in Division of Advancement. I report to the Vice President of Advancement. Um, we, I sort of have, I don't have a dotted line to the President, but I know how to get hold of him, and he knows how to get hold of me. Um, we do a lot of his events, and so we have morphed from being um, strictly advancement to we do events all over the university. And um, there's a misconception here that we are the university events department. Um, we are not. I'm actually trying to change that um, so that we do become a university events department so we can oversee more things. Um, but yeah, that's I, I technically report directly um, to the VP of advancement. And Brady, how about your uh, your role there? Um, ours is a, we're a little bit different because our, our office is just undergone or is um, is sort of still undergoing um, a little bit of reorganization. Um, that's because earlier this year we decided to take um, several of our, our separate events teams. We had uh, people who did events who were in um, the president's office, the provost's office, um, people who worked for the alumni association. Um, people who worked for um, the IU Foundation, um, and people who worked for university ceremonies. Um, we took the people who did events in all of those offices, and now we all um, work on one team um, that is called University Events. Um, so uh, we technically, um, our office reports to the president of the Alumni Association, who in turn reports to the president of the um, IU Foundation. Um, but that's a little tricky because we have people in our office who both work for the university and some work for the foundation and some work for the alumni association. But um, you know, the, ultimately we're accountable to the president of the university. So, like Richard, I would say there's a, a dotted line that um, that goes that that goes there, and I certainly email back and forth with um, you know the chief of staff to the president regularly, things like that. Um, and then we have a select group of offices for whom we're producing events. Um, those offices where we all kind of came from. So. I think all of them are probably our internal clients, I suppose, and we're, I would say we're kind of accountable to all of those those offices. Now, Amy, your school is a little bit smaller. Talk about your your reporting structure. Well, we are actually um, within the Department of Development, but there are only two events, fundraising events, that we actually produce, um, both of which are fundraising golf tournaments. So we really provide a lot of support. While we're not institutional events, we do serve our um, campus clients as such. So we'll help produce events for the School of Health Professions, for the School of Medicine, obviously anything from the Office of the President. Um, any event that's being held on campus that we may not have been pulled into, if the President is in attendance, then we end up kind of taking that over. We, we try really hard not to step on the toes of the um, administrators that are planning those events, but in order to maintain the integrity and professional of the event, we, we often do um, pop in and kind of oversee those as well. So tell us, what events typically, what, what, is, what is your event calendar look like? What events do you do? You mentioned, um, you know, a few, but maybe go into more detail the kind of events that you are responsible for. Sure. Our office manages um, commencement, welcome week, um, lots of um, donor receptions and meet and greets with um, our president. We have an employee um, service and recognition ceremony coming up on November 13th that I'm actually in the process of planning. That's about 450 to 500 employees that will become uh, will be in attendance for that. Um, employee giving campaigns, we're, we're involved in, in nearly any high-level institutional event, whether it's a development event or not. Okay, that's fun. Brady, how about the events that you produce? Um, you know, we have lots of different offices from, from which we all came, so we have um, you know, we have a wide variety of types of events that, you know, that, that we're producing. So we have, you know, we have, we're doing everything from meals for, you know, you know, three or four people to ceremonies that have, you know, 30 or 40,000 attendees. So um, as we develop our office a bit more, we're kind of integrating and it's helping us all to be able to capitalize on our, our strengths. So we have some people who are very good at producing those intimate dinners and others who are, who are great at producing um, the great ritual ceremonies like, um, commencement. Um, when you add them all up, I think uh, we 
I would guess collectively we probably produce between I'd say three or four hundred events a year. Um, if you if you pluck out what I'd say like what I call major events or um, uh, ones that you take out like the dinners things like that, I would guess we're between uh, you know somewhere between 100 150 depending on the year. Uh, my personal niche tends to be um, the events that kind of extend beyond just one kind of start and stop time. That that means events that might involve um, a greater amount of, say, public relations or marketing um, or visits of VIPs that might, you know, um, mean uh, several days of events or dealing with more protocol or security um, out of the box type of ceremonies or other other things like that. Um, I also travel um, from campus to campus with our ceremonies team, um, helping to produce ceremonies um, over which our president is presiding when we do things like groundbreakings or building dedications or um, commencements or uh, other ceremonies on other campuses. So that's that's sort of what I do within our our team. But we do a wide um, we do a wide variety of you know uh, uh, of things within our group, and we have we have people who who do very specific things within our group as well. Cool, Richard. How about the kind of events you do? Um, a really basic definition I use is if it's big, if it's high profile, if the president's involved or involved. Um, that being said, like Brady, we don't do all the advancement events. Um, we do the, we tend to do the bigger donor things. We travel with the president. We do do commencement. We do our, we do two annual fundraising dinners. One's an alumni recognition dinner, um, <clears throat> which is 900 people in the summer, <clears throat> and our. We're in, actually in three weeks, we're doing a black tie dinner for our School of Medicine, which is another 900 people. It's actually the oldest black tie dinner in the city of Chicago. And um, it's um, been going on for 65 years will be, next year will be 65 years. Um, so we're, we do freshman convocation. We do uh, Mass of the Holy Spirit, which is the first mass in, of the academic year at a Catholic university. All the Jesuit schools do it. Um, so we get pulled into a lot. Um, <clears throat> I have managed to stay out of the um, employee Christmas party. Yeah, <laughs> That's the one I say, please let my staff have that off. But we're, we're getting tugged into it. Um, again, as we morph into more of a university events thing, um, those are the type of events that will probably take over more. So um, we don't do a lot of alumni events. Um, they, their team tends to do that, although we do, we took, we handled all the logistics for alumni weekend this year. So it's, um, there's a lot of, do we get involved, do we not get involved? How big is your department? My team is five. Um, there's um, three event planners, including me. Um, we have an administrative assistant who oversees all of our registration and um, our student workers, and then we have a data, uh, he's called data traffic manager. Um, he is the behind the scenes guy, handles all of our databases, our mailing lists, he designs all of our registration websites. Um, we use a, an event or a program called Cvent. Oops. He designs it and then our admin administers it. And, and three student workers. Okay, and about how many events do you think though that team coordinates number wise? We do about fifty to seventy five um, that we personally yeah. handle soup to nuts. Yeah. Um, and then we consult probably another twenty five more maybe, where you know, we get a phone call saying we need your advice on this. So when, when people are complaining that they're too busy, they can think about you and I just laugh at them. Brady and uh, Amy say, oh, I guess I could fit a few more things in. Brady, tell us how big is your team? How many people do you have that work with you? Um, I think if, uh, I think now that we've, that we've come together, I think right now we have um, 12 full-time people in our new group. Um, we are somewhat unique in that we have, um, in our team, I have a full-time technical director and an assistant technical director. Um, so two of my people are um, completely responsible for that. So um, so those of us who work as planners, um, we can, um, when, we're, when we have planning meetings, we can create the event or whatever, and then our technical director can take it from there and do that entire aspect of the event. 
Um, we have another person who is a full-time writer or kind of our communications manager, so she's able to handle a lot of the um, collaterals for any given event, um, even when other people may be acting as the principal producer. Um, when it comes to major ceremonies, um, in particular, though, we all have different roles that all need to be accomplished in order to produce events like that. Um, but I'll be honest, and I, I, I'll, I can't tell you the last time I, I ordered a, a floral arrangement um, because that the decor part of events is uh, um, the, of things that I'm producing is generally being managed by just somebody else on my team because I'm doing a, a different component um, of that event. Um, I'll know that it's I'll know what flowers are going to be there and things like that, but um, but we work together enough um, and ha kind of have our different roles that. Um, I know they're going to deliver on their responsibilities, and I have my kind of set of things that I do. Um, and Amy, you, I think you mentioned, but how many total staff people do you have working on your events? We are a department of five. We have a director, three assistant directors, and a coordinator level. Um, the workflow comes to us a, a little bit differently. We all are assigned um, an event to produce based on some of the other projects we may be working on, just general workflow, um, and kind of our, our strengths and our skill set. But um, once, the, you know, say the week of the event, it's all hands on deck. We all help out however we need to to pull the event together, um, each have a role in the, the evening of the event, and, and you know, we, we all help each other out, which is really terrific, kind of like, how Brady was saying that everybody has their kind of piece of the puzzle that they're an expert at, and, and that's kind of how we divide and conquer the night of an event as well. Do you use a lot of student volunteers? We have no student volunteers um, <laughs> to produce events. Um, we do have a group um, of student ambassadors who are we can um, use to help on tours, um, but they, but they don't, they don't really help us as greeters or um, anything, ushers, anything like that. If we have a high-level group coming in or a high-profile event, we can use them for those kind of things to help, you know, meet some of our donors, take them on tours of our newest um, building on campus. But we, we don't have student help otherwise. Let's um, let let's talk a little bit about how you keep your roles in check, your job responsibilities, and how you educate other folks on campus. Um, you know, people might come to you and say, I need help with this, or I want to do this. And you probably, as a, an event professional, want to maintain standards and consistency with your brand and within your institution. How do you educate others within, you know, your institution as to your roles and how what they need to do also to keep that brand. Richard, do you want to start with that? <coughs> sure. Um, you know, it's something we, we honestly we struggle with here. Um, I had a conversation with the president once when I was proposing changing our department, and I said, there's a misconception that we're at the University Events Department. And he said, well, what's the misconception? <laughs> I said, you're making my point. Um, we're not. It's... Um, you know, we're lucky that we have the respect of our, a lot of our colleagues outside of our division, um, that we are the experts. Um, and, um, but it's balanced with the fact that, not that we don't have the respect, because we do, but everyone thinks they're an event planner. And, oh, I planned my sister's wedding. I did this, whatever. And um, it's sort of getting them to understand that this is not a hobby for us. It's a career. And what we bring to the table is a talent that, you know, yes, anybody can plan an event. It doesn't mean it'll be a good event. It doesn't mean it'll be a successful event. But anybody can plan an event. So it's, it's educating them to understand that we bring strategy to the table. We bring critical thinking. We bring experience. And that, um, you know, I was just asked to, oh, I want to do a sit-down dinner I want to close the street down and do a sit-down dinner for 300 people on Pearson Street. And and I said, no, you don't want to do that. And they said, well, why not? I said, because the street's 32 feet wide, and you'll be able to fit two tables per row, so you'll have dinner at a bowling alley. Exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. How did you know that? And I'm like, 
because that's what I'm supposed to know. <laughs> you know, it's that type of thing. So it's a, it's re-educating them in that we are professionals at this. And, you know, luckily if you if you have enough successful events that your your product then can start speaking for itself. And, um, you know, and say, have I screwed up yet? <laughs> you know, I've been here 12 years. Haven't had a, had a haven't had a mishap yet. So, um, so it's 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 a balancing act that here's what we do and here's what we don't do. And I you know I'm sort of with Brady in that yeah, picking the flowers is fun, picking the linens is fun, but um, you know I don't get involved so much in that. It's like I don't care what linens you pick. <laughs> you is, know, is there a way that you can? educate these say smaller departments that do their standalone events to make sure that that institution brand and that level of professionalism and accuracy and excellence is woven in even if you don't touch it. Does anybody want to answer to that? Well uh, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I, I've been kind of, <laughs> as Richard was talking, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, what what is important to understand is that when, when you have your external constituents come into the, come into your university, you know they don't they don't care and they don't know who planned the event. So they don't know. Um, they just know that they're coming to Indiana University and they're going to an event. So they whether it was done by by my group or whether it was done by someone outside my group, um, it doesn't it doesn't matter to them and they don't know. So. Um, if we, um, you know, if we uh, see that that someone is doing an event that has some sort of advancement goal, or um, has a possibility for public relations, or um, is dealing with um, a, you know certain types of um, constituents that we that we like to be involved in, then we'll make sure that we're we're involved in at least a consult consultant role, so that we can make sure that quality is maintained. Um, if we kind of washed our hands of anything that we saw that was going awry and said it wasn't our problem or responsibility, it hurts all of us because it, it's reflecting poorly on the institution, and that's that's the, I think that's probably paramount for all of us um, to remember because um, it's easy for us to you know say we're only responsible for these offices, but 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 you know the people coming to events at the university they don't know or care who's actually producing the event. Um, that's that's I, I, uh, yeah I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, I think to that point, it's um, because you know at our university we're relatively high profile, so people go to an event and they make an assumption that we did it, and you know there's nothing worse than when you're at an event and it's going just sideways, and people assume you had something to do with it, and it's one of the reasons that I want to set a standard and set a a um, a clearinghouse for, you know, the the offhand event planner to come to that this is the standard, this is how we do things. So, I, you know, I've been pulled into many events three days before an event because it's going sideways and said, here, we need your help with this. And then there's so many components that I can't change. And and then people are at the event and they see me and they oh Richard the, you know and I, you know you want to go I had nothing to do with this. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I think we've all experienced the kind of the same scenarios. I think one of the things that, that we've instituted here at EVMS is an events task force that meets monthly uh, to train up some of the junior planners on campus on uh, the policies, the procedures the resources that they have available and, and what our expectations are. Um, because we simply can't plan everything, we want to make sure that they have all the tools available um, possible and they it, all the planners have an opportunity to meet with the task force members which are representatives from police and public safety, media services, parking, housekeeping, um, facilities, and the events department. So. We all can have roundtable discussion on the events that they're planning, ways that we might be able to assist them, and it gives us an opportunity to see the holes in their plan and say, oh, have you thought about this, or this isn't enough seats, or oh, you haven't you know, requested your linens from materials management, and 
you know, so on and so forth. There's just a lot of things if, if you're not in the business and you're not educated on, on how to produce a professional event, they don't even know that those services are available to them. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That's just the way we try to reach our campus. That's, that's a great idea, the whole task force, because it does allow you to have some consistency, you know, educate, like you said, the junior planners or other areas on campus that might be doing events. Um, we have one of our participants, Lindsay, asked, do you have involvement in student-focused events besides commencement and convocation? So whether it's, um, you know, any student any student event throughout the year that, that happens. I know there's entertainment and sort of, you know, networking kind of things, campus-based things students do. Does anybody have involvement with those? We consult a lot on it, and it's one of the things I'm trying to change is I would love to have the student development event planners report up to me um, and become part of our big house because <clears throat> we don't, we're not responsible for the events, but I end up having weekly phone calls. Oh, Richard, would you take a look at this? What do you guys think of this? You know, have someone from special events come to our meeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, the student development folks have a certain expertise on, on student development events are different than alumni events. They just are. Mm -hmm. um, but we have more alike than we do different. And um, so right now it's, it's on a consultation basis. Um, but beyond commencement and um, um, orientation um, and, you know, stuff, those are the only two that we're completely responsible for. The other ones we just advise on. Brady or Amy, how about you with other student-type events? We have an application process that the students go through um, through student affairs. So they'll f fill out um, a PDF application, answer um, several questions, and basically why they're having the event. Um, so we can kind of wrap our arms around that and uh, figure out what kind of resources that they may need, how it's going to be funded. Um, once it goes through the student affairs process, it gets passed through to development to make sure um, they're following institutional guidelines and that they're not soliciting um, any of our external partners that we might already have uh, an ask into. Um, we want to make sure that we're not double dipping, if you will, and you know, asking them for a meager $25 gift card for part of a fundraiser when they're actually being asked to make a $25,000 gift. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's kind of important that they come through us for things like that. Um, and then we can sign off on it when, once we make sure that they're they're not doing any kind of offenses like that. Um, another panelist, uh, or another um, attendee asked, do uh, any of the panelists, have they worked with or know a little bit about other departments, such as undergraduate admissions? Um, is there an event component to recruitment um, that you would get involved with, mm -hmm. admissions? Our alumni people get involved in, in um, I forget what they call them. Um, they're not welcome events. They're kickoff events where it's hosted in a city and there's, you know, 75 students from Pasadena. An alum will host a send-off event for freshmen going to there. Um, we don't get involved too much with admissions, primarily because their calendar is different than ours and their city priority is different than ours. Um, for example, um, Miami is a huge feeder market for us at Loyola Chicago. God knows why. It must be they want our winners or something. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but we don't have alumni in Miami. We have, my, we have alumni in Sarasota, um, but we don't have them in Miami. And so we attempted to do it one year um, to tie the trips together, the road shows and the admissions road trips. And we learned, we figured out it just didn't work. Um, they plan um, they're, they plan f much less out than we do. We try to work a year out, and they work three months out. Um, so it's, a, it's just, it was two worlds that we tried to put together, and we found it didn't work too well. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about using 
either outside planners or outside vendors to support some of your campus-based events, whether it be production companies, um, decor companies, registration assistants. Are there times that you need outside planners or vendors to help you um, on events, and do any of you use them? How do you go about like recruiting them? Anybody want to jump in on that? Um, I, I can start. Um, you know, I, we have a little bit larger team, and like I said, we have a we. You know, we're fortunate enough that we have a, a technical director already on our staff, so we can, and you know we already own, um, you know, a full set of production equipment as far as sound and lights and and you know drape and everything like that. Our unit um, owns all of that those types of things already, um, and if we don't own them, then we're able to just rent the materials um, and still have our technical director um, or additional labor that he hires be able to, to manage a lot of those things. So we don't have to hire um, external companies to do things um, like production as often, I think, probably as um, as other universities might, or as I did when I worked um, uh, at on other campuses or at other universities uh, because, because of the staffing situation that I have now. Uh, we do hire external vendors or uh, um, use external companies. You know, we, we obviously we use technology from um, for, for things like you know we could use registration companies or uh, or or check in or um, you know room layout or you know things like that. We we'll use we you know we use vendors for that type of software. I mean that you know that those types of things we 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 definitely partner with um, external vendors to get. Um, but as far as actually producing events, um, uh, we are able to be self-sufficient unless it comes to major um, events. Say, like, like um, we have, we'll have a campaign, um, like we have a campaign kickoff event, then we'll have to bring in outside production companies and things like that, just because of the sheer scale. Um, just because of the sheer scale, so we'll need we'll need more people like that. Or we had an event in Saudi Arabia last night. Um, and you know, none of my staff went to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so, uh, none of a trip. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, that was uh, that was coordinated from afar. Um, I, I wasn't responsible for that, but I'm sure like a destination management company was used for for um, for that type of event. But uh. how about Amy or Richard? Do you ever have the opportunity to um, either bring in outside planners or outside vendors to support? Maybe if you were doing sort of an anniversary or one-time event that you really wanted unique and different. Um. We, we don't bring in outside planners or producers. We, do, we pretty much do that in-house. It goes back to that's what my background is in. So um, we don't need to hire um, you know, uh, someone to think up the ideas for us. We, we have an in-house communications department that does our writing for us. Um, we do bring in production companies, so lighting and sound. I have a small stash of our own um, lighting and drapery and staging and things like that, but not you know even large enough for commencement. Um, so we tend to be pretty heavily involved. We are um, I'm real big on software. So we have room design software, we have registration software, we have iPad check-in software. Um, i'm I'm real big on technology and um, so we'll bring in, um, even when we have the Dalai Lama here, um, we didn't bring in a production company to help us plan it. We, we planned it ourselves. We brought in security firms and, you know, lighting and sound and et cetera, et cetera. But um, our president, we're pretty frugal when it comes to, you know, I'm not going to hire a special events company to, you know, we're not one of those that say, here's, Fifty thousand dollars plan an event for us. We don't do that. Um, we we're, we're very involved in that regard. Amy, do you ever have the opportunity, or if you were to add someone, would it be an internal staff person that you might add if you felt like you know the workload warranted it? Yeah, we we've um, seasonally we have hired um, a temp to help us with some of the smaller logistics. Um, but not to really help coordinate or produce an event. We we have um, a great group of vendors that we use to execute our events um, and pull together all our rentals. We 
we just bought with some lighting, but um, you know, for some, some of our smaller events that we produce on campus. But for the whole week, I mean, we have to rent everything because we are so small. We have a, a company that comes, a, a lighting and um, lighting and media company that comes during commencement um, from Northern Virginia. They come down and and hang all our truss and do all our draping and hang all our banners and light it and they do a beautiful job and we're lucky um, to have a great partner to help us pull that together but as, as small as we are we, we don't have all the luxuries that the other schools can afford but um, it looks like we do when we're done. Mm -hmm. Oh I'm sure. <laughs> Someone uh, asked Richard what on-site iPad check-in app or software do you use? We use a couple of them actually. Um, we use social tables a lot, but Cvent um, also has an on-site app check-in. And so Tom, sometimes depending on the event, um, dictates which which software we use. They're both very similar. They're both very good. Um, it all just depends on did we use Cvent for the check-in, which if, if we produced the event, we did. Um, or did we not, or what What information do we, they each have their own little quirks that dictate which one we use, but um, we, um, I, it's one of those things that, it's a, it's a deal breaker for us if we're asked to do an event. Um, we tell them, we use Cvent, and this is how much you're gonna pay for it, and we use, uh, we don't charge for the check-in, but we use iPad check-in. We don't do binders anymore, and um, so sometimes they'll need to pay for the rental of iPads um, to um, support the registration staff. Um, but we'll never go back to binders. Um. No. It's uh, a, new, a new era. Yes. The ease and the, um, also like the flow of information. You know, when you do things electronically, you can be, have 10 people checking people in and it all comes together and it just makes it so much more efficient for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to move to the characteristics and skill set that um, each of you feel is essential for your role as academic planners. Amy, do you want to chat first about that? Like, what what do you think of the compelling skills and talents and sort of um, you know knowledge that someone needs to really wrap their head around to be successful as an academic planner? Um, for the last um, couple of positions that I've had, I really think a, a background in development is really important for what we do. Um, it drives a lot of the messaging um, and the strategy behind an event. Um, I certainly think part of your skill set, you have to be very organized, manage your time wisely, um, high attention to detail. Um, a, a, as all of you can attest, uh, a little bit of a creative streak isn't a bad thing. Um, but I, I think those are kind of the things that are paramount for us is being organized in the high attention to detail. Brady, how about you? Do you have uh, sort of a, a list of what you think are the essentials? Uh, I would I would say for, for what we do, I would, I would echo Amy in that, um, that understanding why we produce the events we produce is uh, is almost uh, as, I would say as difficult, but it's it it's it's definitely as important um, uh, as the events we're producing because um, if we don't know why we're producing the event, then we don't know how how to correctly produce the event. Um, the last person that I hired um, was actually she was a um, a prospect researcher. Um, at a university before I hired her to work in event planning. So she had experience, um, you know, volunteering, doing nonprofit events and things like that. But what she was doing day to day was working inside um, CRM software and, and she knew about the development process and about, um, about you know, why we had attendees um, invited or attending certain types of events. And, and she understood how that process works. That understand that that is how we develop our messaging um, that is how we develop our invitation lists, um, and that is, um, you know, that's that's how our events really come together. Um, is the is the why we're doing what we're doing, and since she already had that knowledge, um, that was the that was that was her real the real strength. Um, uh. Yeah, and I, uh, Richard, how about you? Any other add-ons for? I think 
I, 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 everything Brady and Amy said, um, I think, and I think you got to have just a tiny bit of crazy in you. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you. Why else? Schedules. And... <laughs> yep. Well, um, I I do think too that you know we all have had these different backgrounds. Many of them have been on the creative side or the instructional side. Amy being in education, my background was education, but also music. I was um, a voice and guitar major way back when I went to college. And, um, you know, I have found over the years that the formal education, while important, wasn't always available. And it's just being out there, volunteering. Um, you know, talking with people, finding mentors, finding opportunities that you can, you know, refine those skills, um, you know, is, is really important. And I think, too, in academic planning, what I have seen with people that I've spoken with is that they also have to be able to do a lot with a little. Mm -hmm. um, and, and money isn't always, like in corporate planning, your budgets might allow you to get the look you want quite easily by purchasing items. But in academic planning, you've got to be a little more creative in reusing or repurposing things from event to event so that you can stretch, you know, those those donor dollars because a lot of it does come from, you know, from donors. Um, um, the other thing that we wanted to ask, I'm going to flip over to Brady. Uh, we wanted to ask to share an event that you're working on right now. Before, before you do that, we do have the chat box. Some of you have been using it. And you can see over um, on the screen there's a chat area. If any of you want to ask questions, feel free to put them in that chat area and our panelists will see them. Um, and while we let people ask those questions, Brady, share with us an event that you're working on this week. Uh, yeah, the event that is, that is consuming all of my time um, um, this week is that um, next Tuesday we'll be hosting an international roundtable that's it's looking at the long-term effects of, of World War One and how they affect today's political environment. So uh, we will have the ambassador from Australia, the ambassador from Austria, the ambassador from Bulgaria, um, the minister and deputy chief of mission from Germany, the counselor and head of political affairs from the Italian embassy, um, consul general from Belgium out of New York, um, consul general from uh, France, Serbia um, and the United Kingdom out of Chicago, and um, former uh, Senator uh, Dick Luger and Congressman Lee Hamilton, who both did um, a lot of um, foreign affairs work when they were in Congress. Uh, they're all coming to campus um, on the same day next Tuesday. So um, just the just working through the comings and goings of everyone is uh, is a bit taxing. Uh, not to mention the protocol involves and everything from how they're um, addressed when you're um, speaking to each one of them to where they are sitting at dinner that night. Uh, you know, I think that type of stuff is, is fascinating, but it's, uh, it's time intensive, so you can, uh, you can kind of imagine the extra measures that, um, that, that, uh, that need taken when they're all going to be here at the same time. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's what's taking up my time uh, this week. <laughs> and I, I think what Richard said about having a little bit of crazy you know, you do have to be able to have a very big picture on things. Um, I want to just say thank you to Brady. Um, this past year, Brady and I have been working on our academic course. He's been our course developer at the Special Events Institute, working on our specialty course, Academic Events. And um, I've learned so much in just our, you know, our discussions and our, our work sessions. And things like protocol and, um, you know, risk and just other parts that aren't sort of the glamorous parts of event planning are really the essentials in doing the job right in an academic uh, setting. Um, and I think if you as the public, as students or attendees in this, in this chat, can sort of embrace that, if you gain that knowledge and have that understanding, it's going to make you so much more of a valuable planner and better positioned to um, assume that you know, higher level planning role where you are um, or get that position at an academic institution um, if you really understand that those unique areas of protocol um, you know and risk and things like that 
Um, so thank you, Brady, for all the work you're doing on our course. It's starting up after the first of the year, so please stay tuned um, for the opening of that course. Uh, so Amy or Richard, do you want to share any events that you have going on right now? Um, like I mentioned earlier, three weeks from now we have our annual black tie fundraiser. Um, it's at the Field Museum. It's for our, our School of Medicine. And we give away two awards. Um, one is called the Sword of Loyola. And it is an actual sword that <laughs> we present to the awardee. And they always laugh when they see it coming down the aisle. And they're like, oh my god, it's a real sword. And we're like, yes, it's a real sword. Um, and it, But it has a debutante component to it. There's 25 um, young women, uh, men and women that are high school seniors that are presented and 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 all the stuff that goes with that it's it's actually pretty humorous but um, it's a it's part of the tradition that's uh, been involved that sounds fun <laughs> um, someone, someone just asked about the budget range for some of, of your events what's a budget for something like that Richard or even Brady for your sure, the, the event for the stretch dinner is four hundred thousand dollars um, just to walk in into the field museum is thirty seven thousand dollars. Wow, um, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. And how about Brady yours for the um, the World War One round table? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. It's uh, I can't give you a solid number. Um, big. <laughs> uh, it's it's probably not as big as you think, um, but you know they're all providing their own flights and things like that, and we're providing you know local transportation and things like that, and they're all ambassadors and, and diplomats for their countries. So, I mean, we are not paying them to come. This is what they do as their job. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, we have you know we have additional measures around the university that we'll be taking, but um, you know, and it's production for you know just having a panel of twelve panelists up there. So. The budget is not um, as huge as one might think, but it's coming from several different places, so I don't, I'm not sure I could I could take a number on it. Um, but, but to sort of answer her question, though, I did an event two years ago. We unveiled a new statue on the campus, and the president said, "You have no money." <laughs> and I was like, "What?" <laughs> He's like, "You have no money," and I had to produce it with no money, and we did, and it was fun and unique, and we you know we pulled everything out of the supply closet we could find, and it worked. But you know, sometimes you don't have any money. Um, but it doesn't mean you can do you know crappy product either. So that's when you get creative and crazy. Uh, Amy, do you want to share any events like a an event you might be working on this week or this month? Sure. Um, next Thursday, I'm sorry, November thirteenth, um, Thursday, November thirteenth, we are having the EVMS Service and Recognition Award ceremony for all of our employees. We recognize um, employees meeting their five-year milestone, so anywhere from five to 40 years of service. Um, in addition, faculty and staff members who have won an achievement award. Um, this, this reception is about 450 to 500 attendees. Um, we have a, a full staff to manage registration, move traffic, um, and help get everybody into the program. Um, which is a, a seated ceremony. Um, budget for that is just under $60,000 um, to produce all the awards, all the rentals, um, the lighting and, and audio company that we hire to come in and assist us, all the food and beverage for, for 450 people. So um, a nice annual event that we do every year. I think our campus community enjoys um, the opportunity to come in and mingle with each other and recognize um, the awardees. So it's a lovely evening. Um, now, one of our, our attendees asked horror stories. In light of Halloween, does anyone want to share a recent <laughs> horror story and how you turned it around and resolved uh, the, the issue that it might have presented? Does anybody want to share something scary? I can uh, tell you last year at um, commencement, the day before our speaker canceled. Oh. Um, <laughs> that was that was pretty tough on a Friday afternoon to regroup and um, revert into kind of crisis management because we we had not had a plan um, previously, but we will this year. And so we had to f quickly find another speaker, um, which was one of our faculty members. So if you can imagine. Um, rewriting an entire script, 
letting the platform party know what's going on, all the marshals, the president, um, the dean of the School of Health Professions, the dean of the School of Medicine, letting everybody that needed to know. On top of that happening, um, horrific flooding to where none of our graduates could really get to rehearsal and pick up their regalia. Um, so we were fielding calls left and right and on all kinds of personal cell phones from students saying, oh, I know this is mandatory. How do, what am I going to do? I can't get there. And, and um, so we have a whole new risk plan um, that we're developing and crisis communication for this year. So our team was phenomenal. All of external affairs pulled together and rewrote a script and got a new speaker. And if you didn't know, you wouldn't have known. And I, I think that um, speaks volumes about the team that I work with. The, the true or the true professional coming through. Any horror story for you, Brady? Uh, yeah, I've had, I've, uh, I've done a groundbreaking with the tornado warning going through the county right next to mine when I was in Kansas. I've had someone um, choke and go unconscious at an event. You know, um, the, I think, you know, when I was a personal safety, those are, those are your worst horror, horror stories, when, those types of things. Um, probably the the you know the the worst thing that's happened this year uh, was when we were on our um, commencement circuit. That's when we do commencements uh, in in all on all of the campuses over the course of a week uh, in May. And so we were in New Albany at our southeast campus, um, and that um, commencement ceremony we hold outside. And uh, the we have to decide the day before whether we're going to move it to an inside ceremony. And it was a 30% um, chance of rain. So we decided we would go ahead and move and do it outside the following day on Monday. And um, we uh, got to the ceremony and had about 6,000 people um, sitting outside. And we uh, processed all of the graduates and uh, brought in the platform party and got everybody seated on stage. Um, part of my responsibility or what I do um, as part of commencement is I'm our platform marshal. So I actually sit on stage kind of as an, as an on-stage stage manager. And um, we get, uh, we do the national anthem and then we're like halfway through the prayer and then I hear my technical director tell me in my ear that we've had lightning strike um, within 10 miles of our event, which means I have to take my, um, my pre-written note out of my uh, binder I carry with me uh, and take it up to the president and, um, uh, and he has to confer the degrees immediately um, and, uh, and then we have to go uh, into uh, our, you know, emergency plan and ask um, all 6,000 people to go into the, the nearest, the nearest building uh, and process all of the graduates out of the area, process all of our people off stage, um, things like that. So it was the shortest commencement ceremony uh, in Indiana University history, I believe, um, and uh, <laughs> We made, uh, we made, they ended up making t-shirts for all the graduates that said pump and a 30% chance, uh, oh, you know, and gave them away the next week. We, they did a school by school commencement ceremony the next week, um, to, uh, kind of as a, as a, uh, not replacement, but to, but to let those students walk across the stage and on the, uh, the inside facility and things like that. But that was the worst thing that's happened this year. Um, <laughs> Weather is weather's one of those things that you never quite know. And it, with the masses of people that you're dealing with, it's, you know, it's tough. You have to have a plan and sometimes make calls. Richard, any scary things from you? Probably the worst thing we've had happen was a couple years ago for freshman convocation. Um, our speaker missed his flight. And he was also, he missed his flight because he was sick. And... So he got on the next flight, but the next flight wasn't landing until like 10 minutes before the event was to begin. And so the woman who was introducing him was an alum who worked for him. And so we said to her, talk as long as you want to talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> and our campus, our chief of security picked him up at the airport and, and, and brought him in sirens blaring. Um, to get him to campus, and they they pulled up. I met him at the car. We took him in, wiped him down, and put him on stage. <laughs> oh, wow. And so the uh, the audience just thought that the introductory speaker was talking an awfully long time. <laughs> but 
they didn't know is because he wasn't there yet. And um, God bless him. He had a fever of like 100 degrees or something, and he was a total trooper. Did a book signing later and signed 400-something books. It was just insane. But um, it was one of those that, you know, no one knew what was going on but us, but it was a little chaotic. Um, and, you know, thank God we had a, a, a campus safety officer with sirens on his car. Well, you know, from from most of these stories, it sounds like, if you have a plan in place, at least a plan B or C, then you can respond. And when things come up that are outside of your control, illness, weather, flooding, cancellations, you just have to have those plan Bs, Cs, and Ds in place yeah. in a really um, efficient way to deploy them. You know, And half of the time, it's or even more than half, most of the time, other people don't really realize, you know, what what's going on. Um, it's just you as the internal planner that kind of is in the middle of the panic of it all. Well, we are just out of time. It's just 11 o'clock. We've been on the call for an hour. I just want to thank all of you, Amy, Brady, and Richard, for taking time um, preparing for this webinar and also being here today, sharing, you know, your insight and your wisdom for um, for not only the uh, attendees of the conf in this webinar, but also we're going to be having this available on the Special Events Institute YouTube channel. Um, the link will be available, and we'll also have that link on our Facebook page. So we encourage everyone to join us on Facebook, Special Events Institute. Um, we do have our five course certificate program, and we're going to be adding our academic events program, our specialty course. It will be a, um, a three-month course that will be available after the first of the year. Um, it'll be an add-on to the five-course certificate program or a standalone for any of you who are currently in events and want to really focus on that academic um, discipline, that academic focus. And I want to thank again Brady for helping me and also Amy and Richard because you're also um, offering content for that course as well. So thank you all very much. It was great to see you all. Amy, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, Brady, thank you as well. Yep. Thank you. And Richard, it's a pleasure to have worked with you all today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for involving us. Great. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day, and stay tuned for our Wednesday webinars. We'll have more academic webinars and other focused webinars in the weeks ahead. Find out about them on our Facebook page or at specialinstitute.com. Thanks so much. Have a great day.